to start recording now. Um, yeah, so we are very lucky to have uh, two incredibly smart uh, people sharing us uh, their thoughts and their work today. Um, first, we will have uh, Paula Villaplana uh, de Miguel um, okay. with us, who uh, I think both uh, Marina and Troy know. Um, I, 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 I've known her for, I've known, I guess, a couple years now. Um, and so Paula is a, a curator, an architect, a researcher, a graphic designer, kind of uh, like a like almost like a jack of all trades. Um, and I mean, incredibly sharp. Uh, and we, a couple, about a week ago or so, um, we invited Paula or we asked Paula, hi Troy, um, to do a, uh, a, a, a graphic analysis of um, of a number of different uh, sacred architecture typologies from around the world um, to try and get an overview of what we of what we mean when we say sacred architecture. Um, so Paula will, will be presenting um, her research into this kind of uh, cross-cultural trans-historical understanding of sacred space. Um, and then after that, uh, Brian Masumi, the uh, who we we all know. I mean, we we have uh, we've been lucky enough to to have had Brian in this group for um, a few sessions at the beginning of our time in September. But now Brian um, has uh, accepted our our invitation to come back and share his reflections um, on uh, the task and the challenges of memorialization today. Um, there, there are also uh, a couple um, kind of updates as to kind of what the foundation has been up to um, and what is kind of going on in parallel to this that hopefully we will be able to share um, a, a bit a bit later in the uh, in the event. But you know, because some people need to leave, without further ado, um, I will I will hand uh, the screen over to Paula, who will be starting um, and sharing screen is is completely on. Uh, unless there are any any immediate questions or or comments from anyone, yeah, should I just want to say a few words be, before we will start because mm -hmm. I, 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 in some point I, I, I need to leave and I will see if in a recording. Thank you, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity uh, to uh, to see even even just on the screen, but to see all, all of you, such a great and interesting and different minds and souls and spirits together. And uh, thank you for spending time and investing time in the project, uh, Babi Yar. And now we're working uh, on the concept. Nobody knows, of course, what this concept is, what is concept, what is not concept, but uh, in um, our mind, concept is, is um, in this particular, Case, is a combination of different point of view to different topics. Of course, to memorization itself, memorization of Babi Yar, uh, and then to the site, to the education, to the time and space. And, um, and now we are trying to organize, and we always uh, have few participants, uh, um, like multi-layers concept, like uh, different people, different personality, big personality, interesting personality, personality who we, um, who we believe can uh, um, have very original um, and at the same time um, respect of, uh, respect of, uh, of uh, respect and uh, and freshness point of view to to uh, the story of what we're trying to tell. And, and we, we're creating different layers. For example, uh, uh, Troy, who will uh, uh, come soon, will, will create one layer. And, and actually, with the same offer, um, I want to, um, to get this offer to uh, all of you. And we can discuss at some point more particularly if you will have a time uh, for example, if brain, brain have time for short conversation, for them tomorrow, any convenient time for you. Uh, and for other participants, I will be very thankful for it. I will then, then tell you in the details what 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 we're talking about. If 
if it's possible. Th thank you so much for attention. Wait, I'm muted. Um, thank you, Ilya. Um, and yeah, so with uh, with that, uh, maybe we can uh, we can start with the uh, with the presentations. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me for for this invitation. It's a real pleasure to be sharing this uh, morning here in New York with with you. And as uh, Nick was saying, he. Uh, invited me last week to start reflecting on a way of diagramming sacred architecture, trying to grasp as many examples as possible. And um, so please take the following presentation as like my very first approach to such a vast topic. But uh, what I have tried is to like, um, systematize and find a way to look uh, at these different architectures uh, in a way that can be helpful to uh, compare and uh, analyze uh, uh, different case studies. I'm gonna share, share my screen. Uh, Paula, just one question, where are you located? So. Uh... I'm in New York. Okay, I'm in Toronto. No, no, I, I, I'm looking at the light, how much light there is in the room. And that is, you know, how I get a sense of where people are. So today it's actually, it's raining. So it's very gray, but yeah, it's still 11 a.m. So you are seeing my screen, right? Yes. Okay, um, so uh, the way to approach this that I, I took for like being able to uh, produce this first catalog in, in a week was to try to systematize uh, a way of reading these architectures and um, to have to produce like a contract, a contrast between uh, what an architectural drawing is, and also to uh, embed it with uh, all the symbols and uh, languages and all these exuberant, complex, and codified universe that defines uh, most of these uh, architectures. And uh, I, I first did like a first list of about uh, 30, 35 case studies to have like one uh, paradigmatic case study uh, related to uh, different uh, cults, different uh, systems of belief. And of this, I started to diagram 13 of them. And the way I, ha I have structured the work is uh, using this system in which uh, you will see it's uh, the same system for all of the case studies. And we'll always have uh, the title in this corner, then uh, the symbol that represents uh, the religion of faith that it's performed, uh, the location, the construction date, some of these you will see were, uh, are gonna be more accurate than others because some are more speculations on what is known of them and uh, of what we're gonna see today. Uh, the span of time goes from the 9000s before the current era until the 19th century. So there are very varied examples of um, architectures in these uh, many, many uh, years. Then uh, there's always going to be the floor plan in uh, the middle and uh, a graphic scale to have a sense of, uh, of the scale of the building. And then the green line in the perimeter, uh, whenever it's continuous, it will mean that um, it's a standalone building. And whenever it's uh, dashed, it will mean that the building the temple is part 
of uh, a complex or of a network of uh, other buildings. Uh, I will also be representing a simplified version of the, um, uh, of the section to see the relationship between plan and section. And then uh, there are other data such as uh, uh, this hatch that we see in the background when and when it's aligned, it would mean that it's a newly built building. And when there are dots, it will mean that it's a cart into the landscape. And then uh, there are offset lines around the plan. And uh, the more equidistant lines there are, the more um, elevated the building is in terms of altitude. And uh, here in the center, I will indicate uh, whether it's uh, a symmetrical building or not, and how this symmetry works, if it's in one axis, in two axis, or if it doesn't respond to this. Uh, in the corners, uh, uh, I will talk about if uh, whether it is a monotheist a religion, polytheist, or if it responds to another system of beliefs. Uh, I will also talk about uh, the spatiality in terms of if I'm gonna uh, here are all the icons that are gonna be represented in the in this uh, diagrams. Uh, so uh, we're gonna have like the different faiths. Um, I will be marking the access uh, if whether it's uh, monotheist, polytheist, or it's based on other systems. Uh, the spatiality uh, making difference between um, assembly or auditorium space if. Uh, it's meant to be circulated in a more linear way, if it's uh, meant to um, enhance more individual encounters, or if it's meant to be uh, circulated from the bottom to the top uh, in the sense of both uh, physical and spiritual ascension. Uh, symmetry, as I was uh, mentioning, uh, carved or newly built structure, and then I am also incorporating other elements which are a bit more speculative, but uh, which um, talk about, for example, the rituals that are performed in the space and whether they uh, make use of uh, certain elements such as, as earth, uh, fire, water, or make use of uh, reading of uh, stars, as well as uh, what I call presences, which are in fact um, the agents that intervene in, uh, in the space, uh, either as users or as uh, agents that shape in some way the design and the functionment of, uh, of the temple. And this can be either human or more than human, understanding this as uh, animals, uh, vegetation and um, stars as per uh, cosmologies. So I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna do a very fast uh, overview because uh, I don't want to take all of uh, uh, your time, but I'm gonna describe very briefly uh, 13 of these uh, diagrams. And uh, the way the presentation works is that there's always a first page with a brief presentation and then uh, a condensed image, which condenses like uh, all these uh, symbols and uh, architectural features uh, that uh, describe the building and then more specific uh, drawings about uh, the ornaments or the features that are characteristic to this case study or uh, like this, the relationship between a uh, uh, floor plan and a uh, section. So beginning with the Ranakpur temple who, that was uh, built in uh, 1436 uh, in the current era and it's a, a Jainist temple located in the Pali district of Rajasthan. And it's a temple that honors Adinath the first uh, Tirthankar uh, of the present half cycle, uh, according to the Jainist cosmology. Jainism is this uh, ancient Indian religion that uh, is based 
on the uh, the spiritual ideas of a succession of four, uh, 24 leaders. And uh, this is a temple um, uh, that's honoring one, one of these uh, 24 idols. And uh, it's based on this uh, uh, cross, which is very um, characteristic of um, Jainist temples. And uh, you can access the building uh, through this uh, axis, which is going to also mark the um, symmetry axis. And uh, the building is composed internally of a series of chambers and uh, a huge amount of uh, these very ornated columns that create kind of a, a forest of columns in the inside. And uh, one of the characteristics of this temple is the uh, super intricate carvings that decorate both the facade, the columns, the walls, and that um, accompany the user throughout uh, all the traveling of this space. So in terms of symmetry, it works. Uh, uh, I'm always representing like a uh, the minimal part of the building, which uh, is later going to be replicated. And uh, as per the ornaments that are characteristic of this building, uh, it's these columns I was mentioning earlier, and uh, the carving, which sometimes refer to um, uh, ornaments in nature, or some animals that are characteristic to the legend. For example, uh, the elephant that was uh, supposed to be purifying the idol, and the idol is located uh, in, uh, in an altar in these temples. And uh, in contrast of this cross-shaped plan, uh, the elevation is composed of uh, a first pinnacle and then a series of domes of different heights uh, that uh, uh, enclose the different chambers. And uh, you will always see like a summary of all the symbologies uh, at use in these buildings. A second case study is uh, a Borg the Borgun State Church. Uh, it's um, a Christian church located in, uh, in Borgund in Norway, and it was built in the 12th century. And uh, it is a stave church, which means that uh, one of the characteristics of such churches are the staves, which are the wooden walls that compose the facade. And uh, these churches are built following a, a basilica plan with a central nave and um, different aisles. And uh, there's uh, a main entrance and uh, the traveling of the space with uh, this uh, longitude, this linearity until uh, the apse. And uh, one of the characteristics of this uh, building is uh, these wooden arcades that uh, are flanking the principal arcade. And uh, the runic inscriptions that ornament parts of the temple, for example, uh, there are runic, this uh, runic inscription uh, uh, reads uh, Ave Maria. And this is the runic inscription I was uh, referring to. And this is like the very characteristic profile of uh, uh, staff churches with our uh, Christian churches, but uh, uh, in with a Viking uh, uh, stylist attribute. Then uh, another example I was looking at was the Buddha Stupa in Kathmandu in Nepal which is a Buddhist temple. And um, it's 
floor plan is based on uh, on the on the shape of the mandala is uh, like a huge mandala so it works as a, a huge diagram of the buddhist cosmos and uh, the base of the stupa consists of a series of uh, different platforms which are decreasing in size and um, it stopped with a square tower that uh, bears the, the eyes of the Buddha and that you can see from all directions. And it's um, a space that is accessible from uh, four of its sides. And um, it's ornated uh, uh, again with an altar, this time for uh, and the Buddha bells, uh, that announce the different moments of the ritual. Then uh, it's very characteristic of this temple, uh, uh, the series of flags that decorate and that surround the main uh, figure of the Buddha and the eyes that are present in all of the sides of the facade. Uh, these are the different, uh, the decreasing steps that I was mentioning before and the central dome with the tower and here come uh, the flags. And uh, I'm going very fast just to... Okay. And uh, just so you know, I just organized this uh, alphabetically, not chronologically, just to have like a contrast all the time between uh, different um, examples. So uh, then we go to Gobekli Tepe, which is the oldest of the case studies I, I brought today. And um, it's located in, uh, in Turkey and it's supposed, it's allegedly, uh, it was allegedly built in the 1900s before uh, the current era. And there are several hypotheses about what this uh, site was, was used for. Although um, it's uh, likely that it was uh, used for uh, the cult of the dead and uh, also for potential shamanic practices, although uh, it's just a uh, hypothesis. And uh, all these drawings are based on reconstructions of the site. And uh, one of the features of this site is uh, the columns that organize the space, which are these uh, T-shaped columns with different uh, engravings or symbols, some of them which are understood as uh, an early sign language and others which are representing animals, though uh, these animals are likely uh, more fantastic or uh, uh, fabulous animals than animals which would be used for rituals or um, uh, in the site. And uh, in this case, it's uh, a complex of uh, different uh, constructions, which are all determined by these uh, uh, columns which uh, configure the space and that are aligned north and uh, create these uh, roofings. And the way all the structures are organized is believed to uh, be working as a, a kind of cosmogonic map uh, that, relates, that related the local community uh, to the surrounding la landscape and, and cosmos. Can I just ask you one question? Uh, very interesting. Uh, so you, uh, you believe that it was roofed, Gobekli Tepe, or is this, uh, I've never seen that reconstruction or mm -hmm. this, this drawing, yes. That's the main hypothesis that this that, column your hypothesis. Where, yeah, that's what I've uh, been reading. That was the main hypothesis of uh, this being, uh, yeah, a closed, uh, structure oh okay and, uh, no no i just i've you know this this is completely completely new to me very interesting thanks of course 
But all of these are uh, hypotheses because this is a very unknown site, as, as, you, as you know. Uh, another well-known example would be the, the Apollo temple in Delphi. I choose this uh, temple because, uh, well, it's one of the uh, uh, best known uh, temples of um, the Greek period, also because of its uh, functionment as the site of the oracle. And uh, the way uh, the Apollo temple worked. This temple was not accessed by humans. Only the Pitta could access this temple and access the, the last chamber, which was the oracle chamber, which was protected by snakes. And uh, <clears throat> the Pitta would there communicate uh, with the gods and, um, and, and then uh, uh, read future events. And uh, in terms of its uh, functionment, it works uh, as a very archetypical Greek temple with uh, a field of columns and uh, a succession of uh, rooms being this last one, um, the room for the oracle. And it's a, it's a Doric temple with uh, the um, characteristic of this snake column which was uh, in the complex. This, this makes part of uh, a complex of temples in, in Delphi. And uh, one of the difference between this and other temples is this uh, snake columns, which makes reference to the uh, snakes protecting the oracle. And uh, this would be like the archetypical uh, section of uh, the entrance of this to such temples. Chichen Itza is a, a, a Maya temple. It's a Mesoamerican step pyramid located in uh, Yucatan, Mexico, and built in, uh, in the uh, second uh, the 12th century before the current era. And it's dedicated to the deity Kukalkan. And uh, this temple has like this, uh, again, a cross uh, plan, and it's accessible from uh, four of its sides. And all the staircases are flanked by serpents, which are protective serpents uh, for for the god. This space, this space was uh, uh, understood to be used as uh, a temple, but also uh, a sports center uh, at the period. So uh, it was supposed to work as a, uh, a place for performing team games, uh, probably using uh, balls. And uh, <clears throat> this cross-shaped uh, floor plan uh, culminates in this uh, uh, pyramid uh, elevation. And all the, all the building is ornated with uh, several uh, patterns which are very characteristic to the Mayas, uh, from schools to the Maya mouth. And uh, there's uh, in all of the facades, uh, the representation of the God altar. And the snakes I was uh, mentioning about uh, before uh, flanking the staircases. So, what I'm trying with all this diagram is to uh, contrast like uh, the more abstract architectural uh, shape with uh, all this more ornamental and symbolic uh, universe to always have uh, both, uh, both images. 
Um, Paula, can I can I maybe suggest because I think you know what what you what you've already showed us has been like a really kind of uh, amazing overview of kind of the the mm. the 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 analytic that you kind of applied to these um and and you know i i'm i'm very happy to um to also send out this full document because i know that there 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 are a number of other case studies like the luxor mm -hmm. temple um and and even like the the bighorn medicine wheel etc um but i wonder if instead of going through each if maybe we should um already kind of open this up for discussion or reflection also about kind of the nature of this type of activity um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, cause maybe it's, it's interesting, um, to think about, you know, one of the, one of the ideas behind this was, um, to see like, if there was such a thing as kind of a universality to sacrality, um, and, you know, we, we've spent, we've spent a very long time over the past month, uh, plus looking into, um, the the meaning of of uh, of sacred space for Judaism um, last week uh, Troy gave us a, a, a very powerful kind of whirlwind presentation about um, kind of uh, cosmological principles of of certain practices of certain um, kind of like uh, animist or, or vitalist um, traditions and and yeah so I I, I think it's it's also interesting now to think. Right. So what one of the prompts for this um, was that, you know, one of the ideas that that Ilya has brought in um, a number of times to this to this group um, is, you know, very, very often, uh, you know, we're looking at kind of architectures here, right, buildings. So there, there are some landscapes in here, like, like the like the medicine wheel, et cetera. Um, but, you know, one of the ideas that we are working with here or think trying to think through here is, right, what would it mean? to uh to think of the site as a as a whole an entire park as a sacred space or as a temple and at the same time what would it mean for that temple to not be uh let's say uh, you know dedicated to one religion or another but like is there a kind of continuum to that and i wonder maybe paula maybe you could share kind of some some reflections to these questions um having gone through this um, how you how you kind of see yeah how how you see the, these questions from your perspective now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure if there are like uh, some constants. There are repetitions, like through obviously through cultures and through different uh, religions, on uh, using uh, sometimes uh, the same. Uh, shapes and same specialities for very different uh, purposes and for very different calls. For example, the, uh, the cross is uh, obviously one of, the, um, uh, one of the shapes that repeats continuously throughout many of these uh, examples. The cross, but also uh, these uh, <clears throat> cosmological designs. Or uh, I would say that there are like different categories that uh, repeat, not simultaneously, but that uh, can help us like maybe create uh, categories. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of the things that would repeat in many of these uh, cases would be like the way these uh, constructions are oriented either uh, following some cosmological design so that these spaces are also useful for either reading the stars or reading climate or uh, reading like um, the upcoming seasons or uh, they are oriented towards some sacred space. So uh, this would definitely be one uh, of the constants <clears throat> yeah. And then uh, many of these have also like, uh, there are like elements that are repeated throughout all these case studies, which are, uh, which take different names, but uh, like the space of the altar uh, is uh, mostly present always either as an ornament or as a dedicated space. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious. So Robert, Jan, and, and Troy, I'm quite curious to hear your, your thoughts on, on this work, right? Having both um, also kind of dedicated so much time to, to zooming into two specific practices. Now, what, how, how do you see this, um, this kind of zooming out and really trying to kind of cut across different, um, different, different architectures and different, different beliefs? Maybe, maybe I'll go first because I'll go quickly and then I have to go back off video for a second while I run to pick up my toddler. <laughs> um, uh, common Monday problem for me, but um, thank you, Paula. It's so nice to see you, by the way. Um, and uh, this is this is really great. I can't believe you did this in a week, but you were my former student, so I know how productive you are, so I do believe it. Um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a sort of like impossible task you were given. Um, so, or to Nick's question, right? Like how to- That would be love, impossible tasks. That is, that's the best. <laughs> well, it, like how-, how... Impossible, impossible things. <laughs> it's a good point. So it's a good task. Um, but I, I, I empathize with, the, with it because I'm, I'm also, as you know, for those who saw the presentation last week, have been spending a, a lot of time over the past few years attempting to look for, squint down and see what might be some common commonalities between these structures that are very enigmatic. They can't speak for themselves, um, but they seem to have certain things in common. And for me, I think the, the commonalities have to do with um, like the most obvious things. So where is it? How is it oriented? What is its scale? What's it made of? Um, what are the, what's the symbolism on it? Um, and Ultimately, I think, I think there's kind of two ways to approach it. One is a kind of scientific way where uh, building on research that's been done by others, and in a lot of cases, research that's been done outside of mainstream academia, because uh, I think mainstream kind of archaeology uh, has basically had some sins to atone for that it's overcorrected for. So basically people going into Egypt with a Bible in one hand and trying to figure out, you know, you know what, what happened in the book of Exodus or whatever. Um, and treating things too literally, and then you have a kind of rebound from that where anything that might have a kind of uh, overly religious overtone or might um, screw up the existing um, uh, perceived order of operations and timeline ends up getting thrown out as fringe or crazy. And um, Paula, as you know from the class that I, that I teach, um, what I try to show is um, just in the last 10 or 15 years, how, how much the timeline has been disrupted by things like, as you showed Gobekli Tepe, which was actually buried. And so it was a megalithic site that is made of stone that cannot be carbon dated, just like the pyramids and all the other stuff, you can't really carbon date it. So we don't have an accurate way of understanding how old it is. Um, and if you don't know how old it is, you can only rely on the stars. And that's always obviously kind of pure conjecture. Um, but at Gobekli Tepe, it was buried and it was buried in organic matter. And so we do know that it was, you know, over 12,000 years old, or at least it was buried 12,000 years ago. It might've even been older than that. Um, and so all these little bits and pieces, when you start to align the data, um, uh, I think you need a pretty big data set to make anything convincing to anyone who doesn't want to enter into any kind of belief that there was something uh, profound going on in these architectural spaces. Um, and so I think it's, um, all I wanted to say now is just, I think there's, there are developing sciences and, and there are sort of um, prevailing arts uh, in terms of how these things were made. Um, and they're different in different places and times, but there are some overlaps. And I think it's, it's, it would be very difficult to do that from this sort of diagrammatic approach. I think you would need to know what you're looking for, right? So you need to know <clears throat> some basics about the, the disciplines that I think would be really important are astronomy or astrology. So understanding how stars move and the, the kind of intricate nature of multiple time cycles that are played out in the heavens. Um, and then mythology. So the stories that are baked into that and how those stories migrate and disperse over time. Um, there's a professor at Harvard that mapped this out about five years ago. It's a 1400 page book. Um, based on the way that ge uh, genes and genetics move through different cultures and places. And then you kind of ladder that back up with the myth themes, the bits and pieces of myths that might've moved between places and times. Um, and when you start to kind of baseline those, those elements, the stars, how they move, uh, uh, mythology, the stories, um, the symbolism that's kind of aligned with those mythologies, then these very en enigmatic things start to look more and more less enigmatic and more and more understandable. 
but there's no, I guess, basically what I would want to resist and what I'm trying to resist myself is a purely 21st century engineering backcasting idea that we could find out the like the ultimate solution at the base of this and then just like spawn any temple from it um, <clears throat> because it's lossy, it is nonlinear, it has to do with story that evolves over time. Um, it has to do with imprecise humans doing things in some cases that were very imprecise and in other cases more precise than we could possibly imagine for things that are that old. Um, and all to say that's, you know, when I gave my presentation last week, the reason I based it on using indigenous knowledge as a cipher is because I think that's kind of the, the most elastic way of thinking that allows you to incorporate um, the engineering principles with something looser. Um, with something kind of more in the realm of story and mythology and so on. And then on top of that, I think, you know, for me personally, and these, this is based on experiences I've had myself, so I, I don't have to be, you know, this doesn't have to be proven to me. It's just something that I've encountered. Um, these spaces do create states of changing consciousness. Um, and as soon as you bake that in, that this can change human consciousness, whether it's, you know, deep meditation or it's uh, suffumigating with cannabis or something else, who knows. Um, but these spaces, I think, were used to change consciousness. And when that happens, you do get humans being able to do different things when they're in different states of consciousness. And you don't have to be a kind of believer in an eternal soul or anything like that. Um, this is kind of just pretty basic science. So I, I think there's something profoundly strange and enigmatic about these structures. I think the way you've shown them is like, is really, really interesting. Um, but I think for me personally, I've been trying to rely on other cultures and other traditions to understand these things. Cause I think there's, there's better there's better epistemologies outside of the West for making sense of these things. <clears throat> um, sorry for the grandstanding. I just want to get a few words out before I have to go on to a, on to read only mode. But Paula, this was great. Thank you. It was really nice to see and to see how you've uh, been carrying on your thinking for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much, yeah. Thank you. For I'm still here. I'm just listening. Yeah. Um, Nick, do you want me to weigh in or? Sure. I mean, it's it's certainly not an obligation, but I, but I'm I think it would be curious given kind of your uh, your research as a part of this group. Uh, certainly, I, I think I come from another perspective than Troy. Um, you know, always uh, in the question, uh, I think as a, in a informal academia, of course, the question uh, you have two questions. You know, what connects things together and what and, and what separates them. And uh, you know, following the kind of Cartesian uh, kind of epistemology in which we operate, I've always been more interested in what separates things. I, I do assume that there is a basic, let's call it a religiosity that might be universal because we're all you know, finite human beings in an infinite universe. And uh, that the struggle that, that we all face in, this, in, in a way as human beings, uh, as conscious human beings, are fundamentally the same, uh, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really differ from if you are living in, in the Amazon and rainforest, or for that matter, um, in the Arctic. Uh, but I do think that what makes things interesting in some way, and what what we can, where we can, where we can start understand culture, and I am interested in cultures, is how. The, 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 the particular responses to that universal human conditions are different. And for me, uh, the, the one piece, and, and you indicated uh, actually in, in your beginning that you, uh, that, you were, um, that you were going to record it, but you haven't really talked about it yet. And that's the point where uh, for me, the situation becomes really interesting is the relationship of ritual and, uh, and, uh, and in this case, architecture, because I believe that between, uh, uh, let's call it that universal consciousness, that universal approach to our finitude as, uh, as beings in an infinite universe, both in times and space, I mean, the infinite, and, and, and the particular form, the particular form that we give to it, the architectural form, that the ritual uh, dimension, the liturgical dimension, if you want to call it like that, is in fact the key, uh, the key uh, connector and also divider, and the, uh, the way that 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 operates, and uh, and especially I think uh, in in this case I think about ritual very much not only as it's consciously. Uh, performed and designed, but also very much the way it starts actually 
to, uh, to shape the unconscious, to shape custom, to shape pattern. And um, so that would be the, the piece, and you indicated it right at the beginning when you said, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, you, you started talking about fire and earth and, and water and so on, the way that that would play in. But for example, when I go to a mosque, uh, for me, what makes the mosque unique compared to a church or a synagogue is actually the floor. You know, the fact that there is a, that there is a, that there's a prostration. You know that there is Islam. There is the surrender uh, to the, uh, the the to the to the to the infinite uh, uh, to the infinite uh, uh, in some way unnegotiable nature of the God Allah, and that is that is that is that is uh, embodied in a in a physical prostration, which actually is very uh, physical. Yeah, it's incredibly physical, and I've been uh, a student of mine did a, mo a thesis on mosque. And so at a certain moment, we got uh, the whole uh, Muslim student organizations of the University of Toronto involved. And we started, they actually ran us through the, the motions, literally the physical motions of the, uh, of, of the, of the, of the uh, gesture of submission to Allah, which was incredibly powerful. And so now I'm, I'm looking, I come into a mosque and I see that floor and the carpets on the mosque with a car, the little carpet, which can be the one person mosque. In a very, um, in a very different but very conscious way, as that's a mosque for me. A mosque is a floor which you can prostrate with as a secondary thing. It is that wall that indicates the direction towards Mecca. And so, this is this is the piece in your in your presentation. I know it's there because you said it was there, but you really didn't talk about it. And this is where, for me, in some way, the great, the great, you know, the great. Uh, the adventure is in a sense. And how also do you record things like the gesture, you know, in the in the mass, you know, the gesture actually of the elevation, you know, the, the very the very prescribed way of the elevation of the host, yeah, and the way the priest turns at the moment uh, after the host is up and turns towards the com community in the old pre-Vatican II uh, liturgy, and then turns back and you know for me that that is in some way I see the architecture always literally coming out of those physical movements of the body so that is that is uh, that is right now where my great you know in some way and of course in some way you cannot we wouldn't know that about go back to tape but we wouldn't know that necessarily about uh, the Greek the Greek temple the Doric temple in Delphi but so that's 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 in some way, my uh, grandstanding for a moment. Thank you, everyone. Marina? Maybe, yeah, no, I, I, it's interesting conversation. No, thanks, Paula, for this, because allows for thinking further. And to me, when I was uh, watching your presentation, I was, they are so specific that for me was also impossible to use my architectural mind to find similarities across them. And, I believe what uh, Troy was saying is important to think about the relation between that architecture and larger systems, where it is the cosmos or a you know, system of beliefs uh, and mythologies, stories, narration. But at the same time, also very much I agree with uh, Robert Jan about the ritual. But I was also thinking about cases like, for instance, you have, uh, uh, you know, architectures in uh, Spain, and I guess there are many others where uh, Muslim world and Christianity meet in a building, and uh, suddenly it is a mosque or is a church. You don't know, uh, no longer know, even though they have elements of both. So to me, it's also interesting. Is like uh, maybe the a typological uh, understanding of these uh, spaces. Is, is complicated precisely because on the one hand, it's assuming that the form is uh, a carrier of meaning. And I think it is at some point, but at the same time, many times form is connected to other questions like this space where it is located or just a form of uh, the, the connection between the typology, the form and the ritual might have been aligned in some examples, but in others, I believe that forms have been, you know, copied and translated and reutilized without necessarily having the ritualistic part uh, under which they were conceived 
to lead that process. I think for me, like, it's interesting to try to understand these spaces through form. If I follow uh, Troy, then I will see like how that form connects to larger uh, you know, systems, uh, to Robert Young, how it leads to the human body. But I think that that's at the end, maybe form is not enough uh, because it's assuming that uh, certain, uh, yeah, there is a, a particular ideology in form, which is true but not necessarily in all the cases uh, can be read in the same way. I think that each case, in each case, the typology and the form need to be assessed through different parameters and the specificity also of the sites uh, where they are located, the grounds uh, in which they stand uh, and so on. So, um, yeah. So I think it's in an impossible task, but at the same time allows to, <laughs> uh, impossible task allows to expand knowledge in much more uh, interesting way than when it's a very possible task where we know where we are going. Oh, someone, someone just dropped out. Uh, I was sorry. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think, yeah, it, it was, it was not just an impossible task, but it was probably um, not the, not the perfect brief either, but I think what, what's what's interesting here, and 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 Paolo, just for for a bit of background, actually, this entire the, the entire formation of this group um, started from a critique of a brief that was wrong, <laughs> right? Um, and so I, I I I, but I think it's really interesting to see, uh, you know, what is kind of emerging here as kind of the key the the key terms and the key. Uh, things and and you know I I draw a lot from Ben Lerner here and his hatred of poetry right where kind of in in critique comes an idea of perfection, right? Um, you actually cannot critique something unless you hold that that more perfect ideal kind of in in your in your mind, um, and so you know what when we talk here about um, kind of like site specificity or let's say material specificity, also ritual and cultural specificity. I think the, these now become the terms um, that we can now think about Babinyar and think about, you know, contemporary, uh, you know, contemporary Ukrainian culture and right all of the different uh, practices and all and all the different, um, you know, all the all the different cultures and people that actually form a presence and 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 are present on this site at almost a daily on on a daily rhythm i think for me it really raises this question right you know there already are rituals there right rituals are almost never just kind of invented ex nihilo right um you know there are let's say quotidian rituals there are rituals maybe of a group of friends going to the volleyball court or you know a, a a a group of grandmothers going for a walk, um, right? And so I think what's what's interesting here is also to to under maybe something that we can understand about about sacrality in architecture is that there is this relationship between ritual, uh, site and form, right? And and right because I think what one of the big the big challenges that we have right if we do want to think of 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 sacrality and, and sacred space as a way of commemorating the tragedies that took place on Bab and Yar, it's like where 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 do we start, right? We're not we're not trying to invent a new religion or anything, right? And and we're all yeah. go, no, go. I was thinking that in many places you see that, uh, for instance, in Rotterdam there is full of uh, mosques that are not uh, typical, you know, with a dome and a, a grand, grandiose uh, buildings, but are garage, and they happen in every city. The same with Buddhist temples in many uh, uh, European cities. They are, uh, you know, used the spaces that were former uh, storefronts or shops. And then, then is what it meant, what they make, what it is that that makes them sacred, is the ritual is the different elements, uh, uh, you know, the figures that like, is the, the presence of a um, priest or someone who can mediate between like the uh, constituencies and the larger, uh, you know, religious. Uh. So for me, it's also, I, 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 even if I'm an architect, I also want to, uh, 
um, not to always put architecture at the center of the equation. I mean, it's as, a, as, a, as one of the roles that in some cases could enhance or like give certain visibility or form of representation, narration, but in a way like I wouldn't I wouldn't think that architecture, as we know as building, is necessarily what makes a space sacred. Uh, can, I add, uh, can I add to this? Uh, because I, I, I'm, I'm totally fascinated because in North America, of course, your Toronto is a city of immigrants. We have 100, 198 different ethnic and religious communities. I mean, or not religious, 198 religions, but incredible amount. New York is the same. Uh, I guess that we are one step behind New York, but probably uh, it, because we have more space, there's more ability for people to shape space. You know, 90% of the religious communities are in storefronts, you know, essentially. And I, I and this is my students who I teach, you know, they're Indian, they're Sri Lankan, they're, they're all kinds of subsects and so on, and they worship in storefronts or in shopping malls or a version of that which I think is very interesting. And for me, one of the reasons uh, that the contemporary condition allows for that is because of the fact that religion is not anymore the central public thing in our world. Religion has been privatized, quite literally. You know, this, and, and, and this started, of course, in, in the Americas, in, uh, you know, when you go to New Haven and you go to the, uh, you go to the green in New Haven, where you have the, uh, the architectural embodiment of the fact that there are three almost identical churches next to each other. Yeah. And one is, uh, you know, one is Episcopalian, one is whatever, you know, it comes out of the Quaker tradition and the third one is Catholic. And, uh, and, and each of these churches has a typology that was really for the church to be the single focus of a community, but now they're aligned all next to each other. And when you go to the suburbs in America, you see a street and there will be 15 of these buildings next to each other. All of them with their little sign, I'm a synagogue, I'm a church, I'm a mosque, whatever like that. And they're just next to each other as if there are different shops in the mall. And I think that that's actually for the, I think very few architects as an architectural problem have actually uh, actually dealt with this problem. What happens when religion ceases to be a public, a major, a, a major public for the, for, the, for the commonwealth, for the municipality, it's privatized. And what happens when get, you get a serial adjacency of these various forms in our you know, post public space society, which we essentially are? What, how actually these forms actually start relating to each other? I mean, in the little town where my university is, you know, there is a church uh, that is a Christian church on top and it had its, you know, church rooms in the basement and that basement is used for the mosque and also for the synagogue. And they're moving, you know, according to the day, basically, and there's hardly any difference made between them anymore, you know, uh, and it all goes actually quite nicely together. Thank you very much. So I think, uh, so, so, and this goes back to this whole idea in Babi Yar where at a certain moment Ilya was, you know, I mean, he said there, there, is a, there is an Orthodox church and now we're putting a pop-up synagogue right next to it and maybe a mosque. What actually is happening when we're getting this adjacency? You know, one reading of that is to say we're getting kind of a Skansen, you know, open air museum version when these are traditional forms or are we actually having the shopping mall version? And, and so I think when Paula did the interesting, but really I liked in, in the analysis, I didn't see that much yet. Uh, I mean, I would like to see the thing, but when you're talking about a network, you, know, you, you mentioned, is this going to be a standalone building? Is it going to be embedded? Or is it going to be in a network? Where for me, the real interest comes in, what happens if that network are actually either non-religious buildings or buildings that belong to a, a, a competing religion? Or an adjacent religion, you know what actually, what is what's happening between these things? How they start to getting morphed? Because that's where we are today. Just uh, because thinking about this negotiation, I remain, remember this pavilion of Israeli pavilion in Venice that had this very very interesting project that was in a status quo and was uh, explaining certain forms of negotiation in structures that were occupied by different religions and how the spaces were morphing and how they were using the space certain times of the day or certain, so I copy the links in the chat if you want to see in case you don't know the project. 
Yeah, no, th thank you. Thank you, Marina. That's actually a great, a great reference for this, for thinking of this. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually remember this, this model of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Because um, right, even there, like in a single church, there are, you know, 10 different communities and two that stay there 24 seven, because if they leave, the other one will take their space. Right? It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, but, but I think that this is what's kind of coming to the fore in, um, in Bob and Yar is that, you know, that how, how to create kind of a, a polyphonic and a polyvalent space, not necessarily by kind of by by creating one architecture, the one architecture, but but yeah, how do you allow for 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 all of you know the different practices that that once existed, that currently exist, and that might exist in the future? How do you provide space for those to come into being? But right. that assumes that uh, all these users are as liberal and as friendly towards our rival religions and spiritualities mm -hmm. as we secular people are. You know, I mean, if, if I if I just uh, have a conflict with an, a New York Jewish community, I just talked about it, you know, who doesn't, who wants me to do a presentation, but if I mention basically the name Hannah Arendt, I will be run out of town with star and feathers on me. You know, this is also, you know, uh, uh, the inability to actually live with others is also an inherent part, of course, of, of many religious uh, uh, or, or not all, but 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 certain forms of religion uh, and in certain so in that sense, you know, it's it's very nice for us to say this all, but when we get to the core of many of these communities, they will have great difficulty with what we will be saying right now. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so actually, if if I may, kind of as kind of the MC of of the of the event, I would propose that we that we now shift gear a little bit. Um, so we've been speaking. Uh, to about questions of sacrality um, as a form of memorialization, um, right? But I, but I, I would like to to invite Brian to share his presentation, um, which I think will also kind of allow us to uh, to to really hone in, maybe in in not uh, in a slightly disjunctive way, but to to focus on the question of um, of memorialization, and but I think also questions of, of polyvalency and 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 polyperspectivalism. Yeah, I, I think I might uh, leave my um, uh, leave my image off, so I don't have to contend with myself while I'm speaking, if that's okay. Um, but yeah, I I wanted to raise some issues around memorialization, the politics of memorialization, um, very much from a perspective of that kind of polyvalence and polyphony that we were just talking about. Um, there, there are a lot of thoughts and doubts that I had that were in some ways what led me to leave the board because I wasn't exactly sure how to translate them in any way that was practically use, useful. I wasn't sure if it was really going to be a helpful contribution to the, to the board because I have a lot more problems than I have solutions. Um, but Nick thought that maybe it would be interesting for the board to, to hear some of that. Uh, he also uh, mentioned that perhaps I could, um, because a lot of what I'm talking about moves toward the possibility of having a performative dimension or a participatory event-based dimension that Elio was talking about and that we talked about earlier at various points. And, uh, a lot of what I was thinking about was the possibility of having a certain kind of affectively based approach uh, to that. Um, so Nick suggested maybe I could bring some examples of artworks that uh, that might address that level and perhaps even address some of uh, the issues of how to uh, how to straddle spaces if, if for example, the uh, museum started, ended up offsite. Um, so my main um, issue is just thinking about, you know, when, 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 when memorialization comes up and there's an immediate relationship with the dead and a responsibility toward the dead. And it's clear that our, that that first responsibility is that the tragedy of the deaths should not be forgotten. 
that there's a necessity for a witnessing to them. Also a witnessing to the way in which people subsequently have been affected by it, how their dependents, uh, descendants can or have had to process the trauma and how that might be able to be done in a healing way. Maintaining a relation with the past that frees life in the present from the pall of the past, burying the dead without burying the past. There's also another order of responsibility that I think of when I, when, as, as soon as I enter into this terrain. And it's a kind of call that I silently hear coming from the voices of the dead, coming from the suffering. And that is to prevent at all costs the same thing from happening to the future, either to members of the same group or to other communities. And I'm quite sure that we could hear the voices of victims of tragedies like the one at Babi Yar. Um, an overwhelming part of the message would be never again. Make it so this kind of thing never happens again. Essentially remember the future. So that's the sort of second dimension that I was thinking of, which is how, how you translate a memory of the past into a memory of the future, memorializing the past in a way that doesn't leave it where it lies, but somehow flips it into a feeling for the future. And there's a tension between those two orders of responsibility uh, because one begins with a gesture of really looking from the present toward the past and embeds memory uh, within an affected community. And it encourages individuals belonging to the affected community to identify or assumes an identification with that particular history and encourages them to build observances of that history and responses into it, into their sense of themselves as that sense of themselves is rooted in the past. So one way of looking at this is that it becomes a kind of point of subjectification, creating a certain subjective structure around the events. And that's a mechanism of uh, collective individuation because it's a process by which individuals come to themselves again through their, and through their belonging to the community, come to that belonging again in a way that creates correlations among them held together by a shared affective constitution. And that fulfills certain very necessary functions, but it also raises certain issues because it can activate a kind of sense of ownership of history and of tragedy. Um, but in every case of genocide, there's always more than one group that's targeted. There's always a multiplicity. In the Holocaust, in the Holocaust, it's primarily the Jews that were targeted, but there's also Roma, gay people, transgender people, communists, resistance fighters, the disabled. And the Jew was used as a kind of Ur figure of that spectrum of diversity that became a, became a scapegoat for the different, so it became like a single summarizing image of all that Nazi ideology aimed to extirpate from the social body and upon which hatred and violence was focused, kind of Ur figure of the other. But within each group, there's also a multiplicity between diasporic Jews, for example, in local Jewish Ukrainian community, between them and Israeli Jews, between secular and religious. And then there are the issues of how well, other groups, for example, the Roma, which are essentially transnational groups become the target at the same time of movements like Nazism and, fa and fascism. Uh, so there's an issue of how those transnational groups also relate to the national context. To what extent is Babinyar, Ukrainian tragedy, 
where you can't create in crime? How do the transnational formations settle on that national territory with a sense of local identity? So inevitably there's these complexities and struggles that, that you're all very aware of over the struggle for memory and in a sense, ownership rights to the memorialization. And it can even come sometimes fall into sort of comp competition over recognition of pain and trauma. So the question for me is how can we honor the multiplicity embedded in the situation with working with to prevent it from becoming fractious, but at the same time without allowing it to be homogenized in a way that neglects the distinctions and, the, and reduces the, the, the diversity. Um, when with the problem with any affirmation of particularity embedded in that kind of history, the story of its rootedness in the past and historical travails, it has a certain tendency toward a, a, a privative logic or a, or a potentially separative logic by bringing things back to the subject, to the group of individuals that identifies with it and claims it, uh, sometimes with implicit moves of exclusion in relation to others. So there's that sort of privative tendency in particularist collective individuation. So all of that raises really complex questions for me of who the stakeholders are in the, more ex in the most extended sense. Um, if the memorialization of the past as a function of a particular collective individuation moves in the direction I just described, can there be an inverse movement at the same time toward a memory of the future that complements it in a different orientation? One that returns to the past in order to loop back through the complexities of the present toward an orientation to the future. And this would have to take multiplicity as its direct and positive objects into, object and to affirm it as such. And one of the reasons why this is so important socially and politically is the point I made before that it's never just one group, even though it can be focused on a kind of earth figure. There's always a whole spectrum of diversity that's the object of of this drive toward fascistic or neo-fascistic extermination at its fullest scope. So the background for every historical event is a human tap tapestry of diversity and cultural richness. In other words, there's an extent, there's a relational field with many fringes, overlaps, encounters, evolutions, and conflicts that are never reducible to the logic of closed or particularist identities. There's a whole human ecology of differences in movement. So how do you trigger an appreciation of that and memory as an affirmation of that for the future, recognizing the ecology itself as a condition for the health, well-being, and thriving of all of the groups? That comes down to the question of how do you include among the state stakeholders people to come, people of the future. Um, the other thing is uh, there's sort of um, a feeling connecting to histories like the one that unfolded at Babanyar, that for all of the cry for it never to happen again, it probably will. That there's cycles of the rise of fascism. Uh, we're living through one today. We're seeing a tremendous upsurge in anti-Semitic tropes and actions and conspiracy theories related, related to uh, traditional anti-Semitic tropes and beyond them. 
we're witnessing widespread racism, active discrimination in many countries against the Roma. Um, we're seeing in other countries social retrench retrenchments, including institutional discrimination against trans people, gays, other non gender nonconforming or, or otherwise marginal groups, forcing them back into the margins. And next time again, it will be certain that there will be, as again, to some extent, in some way, a spectrum of groups targeted as there was in the mid 20th century. And that spread, that spectrum might be different, the focus might be different or the same, but it's certain that it won't just be the particularities of certain groups that are, that are targeted, but the diversity of those groups itself, the ecology within which they participate. So the idea of an, an I, memory of the future is uh, the idea of an ecologically oriented way of complementing the particularizing collectively, individually, and individually subjectivizing orientation that, um, that I mentioned to begin with, with a, a kind of witnessing to relation creating cross solidarities or what could be called transversal connections, movements that don't go from one identity or particularism to another, but snakes between them delineating their milieu, diagramming their milieu. But the scope can be even zoomed out farther to a larger order of magnitude, even past the scale of genocide to the very horizon of relation and the final frontier of extermination. In other words, the biosphere and the impending ecocide of the sixth mass extinction that we're experiencing now. Because once you start thinking relationally in terms of interlocking milieu, the boundaries circumscribing particularities become plastic, trans transected by transversal connections that weave them into an extended tapestry. So there's a natural movement from a given ecology with its historical context uh, to an extended ecology, a kind of cosmological milieu that and in some interpretations could rejoin the sacred. The movement then is from, uh, this movement's from the social ecology and its embeddedness in history to ecology in the widest sense and its delineation of a nature culture continuum. So are there ways of playing the levels together, creating mutual supplementations? for a larger relational milieu within, within which the centerings on narratives, historical narratives, personal narratives, subjective ownership takes place and which creates tensors outward to this horizon of relationality. So thinking of those two poles, two movements, uh, one in the certain, tradition of affect-based philosophy and affect-based theory, there's a distinction made between emotion and affect, with emotion being centering, personalizing, um, bringing out the cognitive discursive dimension, bringing it into focus, um, and um, organized around forms of, of uh, like giving form to uh, feelings that are related to certain to events. Um, affect is a different concept in, according to this current, because affect uh, relates to the, um, the basic definitions of capacity to affect and be affected. And that puts it on the terrain of capacities, which are potentialities, not only for emotion, but for the dis discourses that can give, have con uh, emotion as their content, other forms of linguistic expression to action, to kind, be, uh, to, to potentials for expression of, of different 
clans that can unfold according to different lines. And the capacity to affect it to be affected puts the emphasis not in the individual centering it, but at the edge of the individuals where the encounter takes place. For every being affected is also in some way an affecting, if, if only by dint of resistance. And it puts it in a field of interaction rather than a form of interiority. So it's a relational per se, and enveloped in it potentially are lines of expression that don't necessarily take the usual forms that we think of when we think of uh, returning to connecting emotion, to, returning to emotional expression or connecting emotion to events. Um, so part of the, the question, in, especially in relation to the performative dimension, if there is one of the project is, are there possibilities for integrating an approach to affective witnessing? There's a, 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 one reference I wanted to share, an, an, um, a writer named Michael Richardson, who has worked a lot on um, historical traumas and trying, trying to think of a, an affective approach to it. And I just wanted to read a little quote from what he says. Affective witnessing updates the corpus of theory on witnessing and trauma to account for both the centrality of affect and emotion uh, to witnesses and their inherent relationality. It stresses the body in its dynamic relationship to other bodies, human or non-human, is central to witnessing. In other words, the focus on affect acknowledges witnessing as both social and embodied. And it leads toward, um, this is me commenting, leads toward uh, practices of the event, foregrounding that to, to issues of performativity that are directly embodied rather than to story which is embodied more in a cognitive separation from the full immersive uh, milieu of uh, a body's performance. So it's not reducible to narrativization, but it's not exclusive of it either. And then Richardson again, affectivity of witnessing entails recognizing that witnessing is always on the brink of becoming political, of shifting from the moment of the event to its proliferation through the body politic. So what, 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 what form of proliferation through the body politic is desired and how can it be staged in a case like this? So um, in an affective approach to participation or to performativity um, in relation to past events, there are different poles there can be a, I mean, there can be a sort of really an infinity of, of modes and moods and atmospheres and, and directions, but there's a, a kind of um, can movement in some, it's often quite, I mean, there's often a movement toward a contemplative pole which is priming participants for staying with the feeling of a complexity without necessarily resolving it into a conclusion, position, or definitive verbal expression, holding any number of unfoldings together in resonance and mutual, and, and mutual uh, commotion, inflecting each other. So priming, and then that can also move toward a priming for verbal expression and coming out of an active, effective encounter, you can sort of, uh, stay in the complexity of feelings, the bubbling of different potential unfoldings of expression, stay in that ambiguity and that commotion or trigger verbal expression that uh, encourages people to create a, a, a narrative or sort of a cognitive line of uh, expression coming out of the affective encounter, but which will have been marked by that commotion. 
um, it can also telescope into the body and look at its imbrication and relational weave from an affective angle, but more, but closer and more intimate to the body. Or it can start from the body and telescope out of the local anchoring of the body, uh, even toward the non-human limits of expression. So um, I don't know if I if I should take the time to go through some of the examples or do we have uh, Nick? Is there more time, or should I leave it at that for now? Um, yeah, I, I would mean, love I, to hear it. I would love. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I, and it's so great to listen to you, Brian. It's just um, such a great uh, learning. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, all right. Well, I'll, I'll, just sure. cut me off if it gets too long. Uh, but I, I can just go through some. Unfortunately, there are a couple of examples that I've seen presentations on and heard about, and wanted to show you that I that I couldn't find good material for. But I'll start with the ones that are good material for, um, I'll share my screen uh, for the, um, is that working? Do you see my? Yep, yeah, we got your, yeah. your story. So that's just great, yeah, it's just gonna be some websites, but the first uh, examples come from um, a Montreal-based Mexican artist uh, whose name is Rafael Lozano Hemmer. And, um, he practices for, or has practiced for a long time, something he calls relational architecture, um, which is a very interesting term in itself. And it always involves stagings of the body in a very well-designed situation where a certain kind of affective expression and often verbal uh, elaboration takes place. So, so this one of them, uh, one of his works is very famous. It's called the Pulse Room, uh, and this is uh, sort of of the kind that homes in on the intimacy of the body, and then open, and then opens it back up, accordions it back up into a common or collective space. Uh, I'll just show you a few, a minute or so of, of this. Um, So I think that gives you a good enough idea. So he's registering the uh, heartbeat of a participant, translating it into a number of parameters that are expressed as pulses and intensities of light. And then every time someone's heartbeat is registered, it moves into the room, the common room. Then when someone, someone else comes, it moves and takes that one's place and that one pushes further. And then the very last one will be pushed off. So it creates this kind of infinite um, uh, con Congress of heartbeats, like taking vital signs and, and making kind of felt experience of the uh, of, of the collectivity of human of human life. Now, there's there's not content to it, but in a given context, that could give rise to a lot of a lot of thoughts, a lot of feelings, and sort of follow up actions. So it's not directive and it's not giving a content, 
but it's priming for people to give their own content, having been placed in this uh, sense felt immediately felt sense of relationality with others. So the next one um, is by the same artist, Rafael Lozano Hemmer. And um, it's called Voz Alta, uh, meaning uh, out in spoken out loud. And I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of that as well. Sintoniza usted en Radio Universidad que transmite desde la ciudad universitaria en la capital de México. Voz alta. Instalación radiofónica y visual interactiva para Tlatelón. Del artista Rafael Lozano Gemma. Radio UNAM. Desde la Plaza de las Tres Culturas. En Tlatelón. Documenta 68. Fragmentos de una historia colectiva. Carlos Monsiváis. Me, me toca ver el principio en Juárez y eran realmente represivos. ¿eh? No, no menosprecio a lo que puedan hacer ahora las fuerzas del orden, pero entonces aquello eran judiciales, policías y quién sabe quién para policías o, o para militares, se van los estudiantes a, al Zócalo y se crea algo que todavía no me explico. Surge ahí el movimiento como una decisión de que no nos van a reprimir. Y de pronto están las piedras, desde luego al día siguiente me entero que todas las llevó el Kremlin, están las piedras que empiezan a, a tirarle a los ganaderos ahí, no hay muertos ahí, ni, ni heridos graves, pero sí contusiones. Y, y se da la quema de camiones. Y ya después eh, empieza a surgir el movimiento. Y eh, el preámbulo, claro, es la decisión de rest. Okay, I'm just going to move forward a bit. This through the through the historical footage, just to show you the participation. Bueno, mi comentario es acerca de la, digo, la represión que vivimos en este momento. Los mártires, todas aquellas personas que lucharon, que vieron por el futuro, pues muchas veces los dejamos en el olvido o solo recordamos la típica frase, el 2 de octubre no se olvida. Más... Ok, so um, I'm just giving you those snippets to give you some idea. So, so there, this, this is about a, a, a massacre of hundreds of students in the center of Mexico City in 1968. The memory was suppressed. There was a taboo of talking about it. It was never, it was never addressed by the governments. It was never addressed in public. It was very difficult for the memory to be, to be talked about. So uh, toward... Uh, in, in, in the 2000s, Rafael Lozano Hemmer tried to create this piece where it would combine the possibility for people voicing their memories and concerns around the event for the very first time with a sense of the embeddedness of, the, of their speaking and the original experience in the city. So, there are these massive uh, spotlights that he put up in the, in the square, Tlatelolco, I can't pronounce it properly, Tlatelolco Square, another one in the main uh, uh, Socolo Square of Mexico City. And then megaphones, microphones, people talked into and it translated the rhythms of their voices into pulses. And then the lights would move and sometimes intersect. And at the same time, it was broadcast in, a, in a, a, uh, an FM radio station all over the city. 
so they they um, aired archival uh, recordings, allowed people to mourn publicly, speak of their um, speak of their memories, bring bring back that repressed memory, but against the whole background of the of the of, of the uh, urban ecology with this added element of of a of a visual sense of the voice moving out and occupying that space and the immersive uh infiltration of their memories of the event into every corner of the urban space through the radio so this was a, a quite a quite an important uh moment in in Mexicans' ability to process their, their relatively recent history. Um, the, the next one I think can be, is, is quite interesting. Um, uh, because this one also again from Rafael is called Level of Confidence. And it's also from an event in Mexico in I think it's 2014, 2015, when 43 uh, students uh, in an education school teaching college were kidnapped and disappeared. And then for years afterwards, no one knew what happened to them and their, and their attempts to keep the memory alive and to keep searching for the, the remains to try to, um, to try to figure out what happened and, and eventually assign responsibility um, and uh, it, it was a very, it was a highly affectively charged point around which a lot of activity in uh, local regions outside of Mexico City, this happened in the state of Guerrero, uh, was organized uh, and it became sort of a rallying point for, 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 um, for responses to the um, violence and the, the corruption in Mexico. So I'll give you a little bit of this so you can see it again and have a sense of it and then I'll uh, explain. The, uh, sorry, the sound doesn't seem to work on this one. Okay, so what's happening there is he's taking face recognition um, software. He often takes technologies of surveillance or of power and turns them around. And he has portraits of the 43 disappeared students. And the participant comes in and this, the, the facial recognition system analyzes their faces. Then it goes through a series of algorithms to match them with the closest face of one of the disappeared people. And then it ranks the um, percentage of match. Uh, and the point isn't to match. The point is to say there's never going to be a match because these people are gone and will never be seen again. But also to make you feel viscerally that there are people alive whose features overlap so that you feel the sense of almost intimate bodily intimacy 
connection with the, the absence of the other. So, uh, so it creates this, this highly, for the people in Mexico who are living through these events, a highly affective and emotional um, connection with issues of life and death and, and, and brutality. Um, and Raphael made this one with open source software and provided it free to anyone who wanted to use it. So it became an, a tool of organizing around Mexico, around the disappeared. Um, and it's been, uh, can be modified and adapted to other, other, uh, kind, other events, other tragedies. So um, I'll just very quickly look at the other ones because I don't have good documentation of them. There's someone who specializes in um, affective design um, called Jonas Fritsch, who's at the IT University of Copenhagen. And um, he, he works with uh, similar ideas of how you embed, uh, embed people in a relational milieu that gives them a lived experience of relational complexity, but also primes them to activate in various ways toward expressions maybe that they wouldn't have come to if they hadn't gone through that more uh, connected or immersive experience. So he's worked on things, uh, for example, around the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Summit, where they took over a lot of uh, bus um, shelters throughout the city and they, and they retrofitted them with interactive systems that allowed people to talk to each other, upload things, uh, talk about the climate. So it's a fairly straightforward way of just giving, giving a way of speaking, but it's distributed uh, throughout the, the city with the city being the question because of its uh, participation in, in climate change. Um, another project he, I've seen him present on, with, which, I, which I, don't, I don't think he was actually involved in, but I couldn't locate it and he didn't respond. He didn't, didn't get an, uh, an answer back from his, from my email to him yet, but it was um, a place in Germany where there had been a large number, of, there had been, a, I think it was a massacre during World War II or a battle, but anyway, there's a large number of people who died. Uh, it was in a valley and the work was um, a bench on, um, uh, up high over the, looking over the, the, the valley. And what they did was they took recordings of sound. I think it was a mixture of like ambient sounds from the area, but also the sound of people's voices recounting what happened. But instead of making it audible, they made it feelable. They translated it into um, uh, vibrations that could be felt on the bench so that you were connecting to the memory and to the discourse directly through your body in a tactile or proprioceptive way. So that's sort of toward the more suppression of content foregrounding of sort of contemplative experience. Um, then there's a group, um, called Spurs, which is an environmental design consultancy that create participatory events around certain issues or certain sites. And one that was quite interesting was around a museum in Indianapolis, the Indianapolis Art Museum. And what they did was create a series of workshops exploring the building in all of its aspects, the surroundings, the soil, the trees, uh, cataloging the life forms all the way down to bacteria and fungus, uh, diagramming their movements and the relationships they found, culturing bacteria, and there's some of the diagramming. And then, so it's sort of site and relation 
diagramming. And then they created in the basement in a non exhibition space, no one that's not normally an exhibition space, they created a, an exhibition presenting all of this material. So it was bringing people into a, a kind of moving embodied relationship with the building, with its site, trying to understand the extended ecology that moves through it, including the fungus that grows in the basement or in the soil. Um, so it's a kind of collective exploration in that sort of extended ecology that I was talking about before, as it centers on a particular uh, art museum. Um, so I think that's, I think that's all right now. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I get out of screen share. There should be like a red button at the top uh, that says stop sharing. Uh, I, yeah, I see it. Okay. Anyway, so that's that, those are just very quickly some some examples and some some thoughts. Uh, the that, the area of um, event based or performative uh, design working with embodied feelings that envelop multiple dimensions of potential expression is a quite wide one. There are probably lots of other examples, but those are a few that struck me the most. Yeah, well, th thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, that yeah, was it was fantastic. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Do we have time to to discuss or what's the planning? What's, yeah, yeah, no, we, we have time. I mean, you know, that this is scheduled to go till, uh, well, it's five minutes from now, but you know, we can... <laughs> We, we can extend this, right? I mean, if, if people need to leave, then of course they need to leave. But but I think, yeah, I mean, uh, Brian has given us a really a wealth of a wealth of ideas and 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 things for consideration um, and contemplation. That yeah, we should absolutely give space for 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 discussion. I have to leave pretty soon. I'm going to have a class. But could I maybe then first just. Uh... Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I just, uh, Brian, I really think it, uh, I, I love the presentation and uh, there are many issues that, that you know, touch in some way on, on things that I've struggled with. Um, one of the, one of the uh, I think, the really important thing uh, that you were talking about was the ecology. I mean, to actually interpret this whole landscape of commemoration as an ecology. Uh, and uh, the problem which you um, were talking on early on is about, you know, how do we deal with the fact that there are more victim groups and that in some way they're all part of the, they, they need to be all included. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wanted to say one thing about it because I, you know, I'm a very, I've been very practically involved in, in mm -hmm. you know, creating exhibitions and so on and getting people to participate. You know, you talk about stakeholders. Now, the question is, you know, if you if you have a stakeholder, uh, the stakeholder in some way needs to see that they are that he or she or they is a, a, a stakeholder, and that they that they that they want to become engaged. And you know, when we talk about the Holocaust, so if we just talk about Holocaust, and now for a moment we're talking about the Holocaust of the Jews, mm -hmm. uh, there is an incredible, uh, an incredible bias in all the Holocaust museums and in the literature uh, towards secular Jews. Mm -hmm. That is the, you know, Anne Frank, uh, Primo Levi, uh, Amery, they become the poster child, so the poster heroes in this story. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that uh, they, uh, you know, they kept diaries, they were willing to speak out, they speak, quote, unquote, our language, they speak the language of the public sphere. Uh, yeah. They, 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 they are, uh, they, they know how to communicate in let's to other groups. Uh, probably 80% um, of the Jews who were murdered were very orthodox, were orthodox or very orthodox, mm -hmm. but they are largely invisible in yeah. the Holocaust narratives. 
Um, and they're visible, invisible in many different ways. It's not only that they uh, generally didn't testify after the war, or, or very few of them did, uh, but they had an explanation of why the Holocaust happened, that it was it, it was a churban, it was God's judgment on Israel because of mm -hmm. modernity and so on. So they didn't feel the need to basically uh, become witnesses in, in, in a secular sense. Uh, also, they generally didn't contribute artifacts to collections, uh, didn't mm -hmm. share their stories. So they're highly underrepresented in the uh, in the uh, in our awareness of actually what happened. If we now go for a moment into the ultra orthodox community, and of course we have that, you know, you have in 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 Montreal, uh, you have your representation. I mean, Montreal is very well known that it has a largely Lithuanian ultra-Orthodox community, mm -hmm. while in Toronto uh, there is a, uh, a Polish uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox community. Now, uh, it's very interesting that Montreal has a, a prospering, uh, well-supplied uh, uh, Holocaust museum, and Toronto, which is a much larger uh, Jewish community, doesn't. Why is why what is the difference? And the reason is that amongst the ultra orthodox, the Lithuanians, the Litvaks, actually are the exemption to the rule that the that the ultra orthodox are not engaging with the history of the or, or, of the Holocaust. They actually do uh, they do have a collective memory of the event, are willing to go out. Uh, uh, they create they create collections. They basically see the importance of artifacts. While in the ultra orthodox Polish community, uh, uh, that's not the case. Uh, and uh, and if you now go to New York and you're going to look at this at a micro level in Brooklyn and and Queens, mm -hmm. you see that basically we have an incredible difficulty of engaging one particular group, and we have relative ease of engaging the other group. If we then go to Roma Sinti, and we go to the gay community. Uh, we go to you know other the, the the other groups that in some way are part of this constellation or network mm -hmm. of victimization during the Second World War. For me, one of the incredible. So, I mean, the fact that it was almost impossible to get any institu any institutional presence of Roma Sinti to respond to our mm -hmm. to our request for help. Yeah. You know, please, we want to represent your story. And they were never, quote, unquote, to get, able to get their act together. I correspond with Heidelberg. I correspond with Brunel, which are major institutions. And they are unwilling or they don't trust us. You know, also, this is, has to issue with the trust. What for me was an... So in some way, there was no suppression. So in the end, what we did is we had to go to art dealers to buy art uh, of, say, a Stoika in order to have something because they were unwilling to lend us anything or to play with us. But then you would expect that in the Schwulis Museum in Berlin, which is a gay a museum of the history of the homosexual emancipation, gay rights, and so on, that mm -hmm. they would be able to, uh, to or, or would be willing to play with us. And you go out there, we have traveled to Berlin, spent a couple of days with them. And in the end, they didn't want their story to be part of our story. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and then at a certain moment, you think, you know, fuck you all. I mean, we are basically putting money on the table. I put, I put thousands of hours on the table, you know, piece of my life on the table to organize that. I am willing to give the broadest possible representation. And if you cannot come to the table, if you're unwilling to come to the table, then at a certain moment, I, you know, you say, okay, I mean, I work with... I work with the stakeholders who are willing to sit at the table, and I work with that part of yeah. the ecology that's willing to engage. Yeah. And this is, no, this is a, yeah, huh? it's no, political. No, 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 really, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So no, no, but the politics of it is so intense and so frustrating. Yeah, that, that's, part, that's part of why I thought I, I, what I had to say maybe wasn't well adapted or I wasn't the right, the right person to bring it. But I do want to talk about a situation. I, I live in the Hasidic neighborhood of Montreal. 80% of my neighbors are Hasidic. I've seen, um, I've seen the tensions between the Quebecois uh, and secular Jews with the Hasidic community. And uh, when I moved here, there were, there were no, Has no Hasidic people on my block. Now it's like 80%. So I knew, I, I, my partner, I knew that we had to figure out some way of living together 
And an affective approach we figured can create sometimes sideways approaches that actually don't go through representation because they don't want people on the outside to represent them. They want to, they want to stay in their practice and to thrive as a community. Um, they're extremely distrustful of the city government and outside people's motivations, but also just that connection to the, to the secular context that translates them into content of someone else's representation. Um, so what, what we decided to do um, was to just set up a situation where people rub elbows and come into contact and just give them that. So we, we set up three community kitchens on the street. One of them was in Outremont. Uh, one of them was in the neighborhood north, which is Muslim. And one of them is the neighborhood east, which is sort of uh, millennial, you know, sort of hipster. And we had, and then we, con we connected with women in the, in the South Asian Muslim and Hasidic community and they created uh, uh, a halal meal in Park X and uh, kosher, uh, kosher pastries and things here and crepes in the uh, <laughs> bourgeois the flying neighborhood. <laughs> Um, and then we had uh, I'm getting hungry over here. <laughs> yeah. And and we just we just made food and gave it away free. And then we had these ridiculously um, designed bikes. Like one one bike was a, co a tri adult tricycle that was turned into a coffee dispenser. Another was a herb garden, a moving herb garden. And and we tried to move people on the bikes from one place to another. And we actually got his. Hasidic women who had never met a Muslim, even though they live 400 meters from their community, to go to that community and vice versa. And it worked because we didn't go through the hierarchy, because that would have activated all the issues of self-representation. We just, we connected, especially through, obviously because of the gender issues, through the women in our group and in, in the neighborhood. Um, and we didn't, we didn't ask for anything. We just set up a situation. And I think it really made a difference. Like a few months later, there was a, a mixed Hasidic, non-Hasidic group that uh, created all these flower, hanging flower pots and had both communities working to beautify the neighborhood because that's a point of contention because the Hasidics don't tend to care for the public space in the same way because they're a lot poorer and really involved in, in taking care of their children and in, in the rituals and things. But they're very well, they're very willing to come out. And, and if, you have, if you have an approach that's a bit sideways and convivial, the, uh, the, it's the resistance starts to evaporate. So now we know our neighbors personally way more than we ever did before the neighborhood was Hasidic. You know? So anyway, that's just an example that there's a non, there's a sort of a level of non-representative interconnection. That's not the opposite of representation and thinking about it in in linguistic and cognitive terms, but it allows you. It's a kind of understory that allows you a sideways approach. Yeah. I don't know if that helped at all, but it's just. A, you no, know, I, I I admire it, and I think it is. You know, I I think that that is. I mean, we. One of the things that we did is we started to engage very closely with the Lithuanian community in Brooklyn, which which is again it, it it's a world as a secular person I'm not at all sympathetical to in a sense, and they taught us they taught me a lot and they also shaped you know once we start once you start talking once you start engaging. Yeah. Yeah, the problem, I mean, the general problem is everything. God, it takes a hell of a lot of time and energy. And, you know, in some way, uh, at, uh, how do you do this in some way? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to make a joke about it, but in the COVID situation uh, and in the situation where we're yeah, working with global connections yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. where well, we always come back to the representatives. Yeah. 
Well, one way might be to build in opportunities for groups to yeah. come in from the outside, like Spurs or like other people to to animate a certain kind of uh, interaction. The idea is that, that you can create a platform for relation that primes and triggers a relationship without preforming it. And no, a lot I of people totally have practices like that. Um, so it might, be, it might be possible if there is a kind of performative participatory element to have part of, uh, part of the program designed to invite those kinds of projects in. So you, you can't do it from above, I don't think. No. But they also, but, um, yeah. Okay, thanks, Sansa. I really have to leave because I'm okay. going to class. So I hope to see you soon again. I mean, okay. maybe you want even to return to this project. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, uh, bye, Paul. I, I thanks very much for your contribution. I really would like to see the other slides. So uh, yep. uh, I I'll, don't know I'll if it can around, be shared. I'll send around yeah? the video for sure. Okay, okay, I'm out. Good. Okay, thanks, everyone. Bye, uh, bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. But, but another possibility that, that I was thinking of is that if, if there is some kind of example setting interactive piece that was of this nature that other things could echo or resonate with or be around, uh, especially one that connected, I, I don't know how, how this discussion has gone with where the museum might be located, whether it will be on site or in the city. Uh, but if there's something that could be like a central feature that connected the sites and and set the tone for that kind of uh, interaction, it might be easier to bring other groups in to create to create more interactions. Yeah, I think that if I may, um, this is what I found actually so fascinating about your presentation because you sort of reopened also the the question for me what uh, between uh, what we need is it an institution that would basically curate and manage ideas right such as these beautiful contributions by artists who actually work let's say through an individual engagement with a site with a problem right mm -hmm. and they do it with with their full heart <laughs> And they just, they will explore, let's say, if site like Kiev, no, for the resources. They will, let's say, if you give them freedom, they might spend time there. They might um, connect to institutions or they just have a one day appearance, right, and leave. So it, uh, like there's a whole spectrum that's quite loose and beautiful in a way and open. So that's what I read in a bit in this, what you also presented in this mm -hmm. uh, ecology of participation right so it's kind of completely open and dynamic and it's not restricted also to a particular addressee of your work mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand that's why i sent a bit the, as a counter proposal the link to the house of one in berlin which you might have heard about uh, no, this, it's an architectural project that actually i think it goes ahead maybe um nick knows even more about it i didn't know it was going ahead but uh yeah, I mean, it's always because I speak to uh, Kühn Malvetzi, the architects who won it, and they're always so optimistic about everything, so, uh, which is, I think, what architects do, right? They always say, it's going ahead, so, so I don't have the, uh, the very latest of it. Uh, but um, if you look, actually, at the films that have been done by, let's say, the three religions, right? So there's a, a mosque, a synagogue, and a church thought together in one space as one building. So they would each have their own kind of... So I'm just thinking that as, a, as an ar architecture to, uh, let's say, an institution that has an, an agenda, right? And many things obviously can happen within them and seems to be a nice project. Also, I don't see really the obvious reasons why, why that would be wrong. Mm -hmm. But it's it's sort of the the opposite to what you so nicely presented, right? With this kind of occasional engagement that is triggered, and people come and go. The like lights are on. This project can happen as long as the the lamps are functioning on the side, right? And this machine is working. So yeah. then others yeah. are coming in. So I just want to. You have something 
to say about this kind of these two sides where things can be. Yeah, open. well, I guess what I would say is that they don't have to be mutually exclusive. But mm -hmm. if you think of them as two two poles of activity that are in, in interaction with each other, I think the memorialization um, activities in the more traditional sense are absolutely essential. Mm. So there's a question of mutual supplementation and, and getting uh, interactions between those approaches as well. So I don't see them as, as mutually exclusive, but they have, but their cohabiting would have to be very carefully considered. You know, yes. Architecturally. And, and yeah, because, yeah. because once you have such a house, yeah, and these yeah. walls, then it's something about whether it happens inside these walls or outside, no? Yeah. So whether it's yeah, attached that's... to that museum or not. And yeah. so, yeah. I tend That's why I'm thinking this... something that connected the site to the museum, if it's not on, on the site, mm. it would create this draw, sort of this tensoring out into the community or a back and forth movement that would decenter it a bit from the, from the archive held in the institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we are, we, we haven't been following up on the idea of actually locating the museum offsite. I think what we've instead okay. been thinking of is kind of decentralizing the museum on site. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in the sense, before there was kind of a strong distinction between the, the, the museum or the architecture as kind of an object within a territory, we're actually trying to, to, to unite these two things. Right, um, yeah. So it's the same principle, but, but uh, on the site rather than between the site and the, yeah. and the city, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but the, the way the the way that I kind of understand what also what you were talking about and kind of within the framework of maybe how, you know, I've been thinking about this project over the past couple of weeks um, is this idea of of kind of potentiality, right? And and not necessarily in the sense of like, how do you create a space where anyone can, you know, where, where let's say, you know, the, the house of one example is, you know, you just give everyone a different space. But mm -hmm. but I but I I mean the way that I understand this is like how do how do you create a space of potentiality that that you know that allows for practice of of mm -hmm. kind of cultural tradition or or faith or um, memorialization or or kind of whatever whatever that is. Um, and I mean, so this is also why it's it's kind of interesting, and maybe I'm kind of like you know corrupted by by Paula's uh, you know work because um, this I see also as um, as you know again kind of like questioning this idea of of the of like how do you how do you just provide space for people to um, to to use right in kind of the most kind of abstract sense. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that there, there's definitely one kind of crucial element, right? You know, if, if we think, if we're speaking about a multiplicity of people, we also need to be speaking about a multiplicity of spaces. Now, that yeah. does not mean the kind of, it's not the suburban logic, right? It's not like that everyone gets their, their little plot on the grid, um, but right, like how do, how do we create a space um, and how do we create an architecture of multiplicity itself? Right, that 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 allows for this this process of of differentiation and 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 singular singularization, but also that doesn't kind of concretize, right? That doesn't that doesn't crystallize into a form and then resists other processes of of um, of, of inhabitation and and crystallization. Yeah, yeah. So mul multiplicities of place, but also multiplicities of mode that can cohabit or alternatively have it the same inhabit the same space. Um, because traditionally, sort of a, a museum, museum architecture is, is, is a container, right? And there, there are archives, and that's a necessary part of, of, of a lot of projects, especially around memorialization. But uh, if you think, instead of thinking as a form of content, you think of Another mode that could be even in the same space, like Spurs's exhibition, the basement of the museum, which isn't a form of content, but a platform for relation, a springboard for, for relational activities. And the conditions for that could include archival material. It's not mutually exclusive in any way. Yeah. Uh, it could take place in 
in architectural spaces that are whose program are more oriented toward the presentation of archival content. Um, so yeah, so I think maybe thinking in terms of modes of functioning that can constructively cohabit is another way of, of, of doing it. Mm -hmm. And that this idea that you can plan, you can design platforms for relation, you can design affordances for relation as such. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one, one of kind of the operative, uh, let's say, analogs that, that um, came up a few weeks ago um, that I put on the table that that's being kind of uh, interpreted in, in, in different ways. I mean, I think Ilya mentioned at the very beginning that we are working now in, in terms of layers. Mm -hmm. right? So we're, we're, we're thinking in terms of um, kind of like, how do, you, how do you kind of overlay different logics that also allow a different kind of spatial logics and orderings and, and navigational systems, et cetera, that allow yeah. for uh, kind of serendipitous or surreptitious intersections um, when one actually experiences this, this kind of layered territory. Um, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, and what one one of the at least for me, like one of the 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 architectural examples of this um, is is actually the the necropolis, right? Mm -hmm. the, this space that becomes and and it's it's interesting how like actually a graveyard is can can serve as as a as a uh, kind of reference for a graveyard, right? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, this this idea um, where kind of each person uh is kind of given a space and and there's just kind of an overwhelming uh kind of just affordance right of, of of different different style different form different different spatiality different climatic condition etc um so so yeah i mean it's just it's it's really interesting to to i mean i, I think that there, there's an incredible richness to your to your thought that that i think um, I really look forward to finding ways of incorporating that into conversations with architects, right? Mm -hmm. Like how, how does this, this kind of, um, I mean, I love this idea of kind of the memory of the future that kind of loops through the past um, and back out, like how, how, do, how does one create kind of a space that, that allows for that? Um, I think that, that that will be kind of our challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, so maybe, you know, we are, we are kind of on the right track at kind of like a, a, a strategic kind of conceptual level of how we're envisioning this. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah, slowly, uh, you know, the, this, this will become really like specified and, and, and detailed into kind of individual, uh, you know, instances and, and, and actual places. Yeah, sounds exciting. Yeah, well, well you, you were talking about ritual at the beginning. Um, and I think that that could uh, obviously uh, relations that you might provide affordances for will activate habits and in some ways rituals. And it might be interesting to look at other um, models of how, how ritual operates. Um, I've had some uh, experience with um, ecstatic popular religious practices in China uh, through a friend who's an ethnographer. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because there's an altar, there's a temple, but there's also the surrounding temple grounds. Mm -hmm. And the rituals are not closed in on the temple and, and the altar. Um, there's this multiplicity of things. There'll be Chinese opera going on in one, uh, in one uh, corner there'll be marching bands coming through while the, uh, the rituals are being performed. There'll be Taoists who come in and then there'll be Conf Confucians and Buddhists and local religions, like the one called the three in one religion that will um, uh, successfully occupy the same altar space. Um, there'll be elements brought in from the outside like uh, like like, uh, like about 15 years ago, a, a trend for the younger people to cross dress when they came through the ritual spaces. So there's so that this is a, a model where there's there is a there is a um, a sacred center, but it's not necessarily centered 
activity that it it becomes becomes the host for a huge uh, multiplicity of activities, centers, kinds of activities, and a renegotiation of what passes through the ritual space as the community re uh, sort of reaffirms itself, including new 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 ideas about gender. So that kind of ritual model, where is very very different from the more uh, Middle Eastern and Western, much more centered, separated out sacred spaces. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for at least personally, and I'm, I'm no expert in this kind of term or this concept or this idea, but um, Agamben's idea of the whatever has actually been quite resonant um, with me. I, I remember, you know, when when this idea of just kind of creating a a, 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 a plurality or multiplicity of spaces. Um, to be used and appropriated with whatever ritual um, with from whatever person came up. I remember Anna, you, you mentioned um, you know something where like we, well you know we, we, we don't want like drunks or, or, or junkies using this place. But actually like I that that would be a sign of life, right That would be a sign of vitality. that would be a sign of appropriation and, 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 and a form of culture. Um, and so I, I think also the question, um, here is also like how, you know, how radical can we be in our openness to ritual? Yeah, yeah. Well, we uh, we actually confronted that same issue. We near near an art, sp art space called the Society for Art and Technology in Montreal, that's next to a small public park, which is uh, skateboarding and drug selling and drug taking center. Yeah. And we, we, we were trying to think of ways of bringing the activity out and into the, into the surrounding area. And you can't, you can't ignore the fact that, 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 that the, the right next door in the plaza, there's uh, addicts, basically in permanent residence. Mm -hmm. so, so we brought things to the plaza to include the, the addicts and tried to lure them in and lure them into into interactions with other people, um, and I could describe what they were, but but it was quite an interesting thing. But again, they were performing the little just little platforms of relation that captured someone someone's imagination around an, an activity, um, and then tried to go from there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just want to give a short reply because I don't remember what was the content context for my phrase about Jenks, but uh, the, um, I, I totally agree and I like this idea of uh, m multiple layers of the space, users, possibilities for to experience the history and also the history itself that is uh, not linear, it's much more complex. And I like this idea that, uh, in a way, as I hear you, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that the, the, the narrative should be, should in a way represent the polyphony of all the kind of different uh, complexes and don't give the direct answer so that people can feel the complexity. And I, I totally into it. And um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, but for kind of like can, coming back to junks at the place, there are certain kind of uh, question for uh, how to deal with the with the life itself. You know, so like for instance, this September we launched there um, like opened an audiovisual installation. And then you, the, there is some kind of sound that, in a way, changing the spirit of the place a little bit. You know that, like, smoothly. The you're already not that person that drinks uh, the beer uh, just by the subway station. You're already the guy who drinks beer under by the subway, but also. Um, in parallel to this kind of voice of uh, praying uh, from, you know, so it's already a little bit different. And then it doesn't mean that we don't want life to be there. We want to have to, to life to be there, but this life has to be in a way, probably, probably, I don't know, conscious about what happened there. Mm -hmm.
because right. until you don't know and you don't you just like you at the moment of just being over there without anything like you are uh you just you just live there and then what we do with those kind of layers we are kind of smoothly showing different complexities so it's not that just you staying by the subway station in the park but this is not the, only the park it's also the place of this yeah. kind of history yeah. and it's also the place for many other histories and like bringing all the complexity to this to the place it's also in a way scenography so what do you do first like what kind of actions what kind of acupuncture you know you, you're bringing on so that in a way that people are there they you know they gradually coming to this complexity mm -hmm. so because you cannot represent the complexity just like this it's no, it no. somehow yeah should be also you, like you can, going yeah. process. you can never fully represent it that, that's why I think affective approaches are so are, are, are so promising because uh, because they they might provide ways of constantly starting again toward new expression and mm -hmm. you can't just have polyphony or it becomes cacophony you can't just have a multiplicity of places or it just becomes a, a, a set of separate loca locations locales you need something like you're saying to indicate that these things, all these elements are holding together and we want you to, to feel that and respect that, that there's something enveloping those together in a, in a, in a shared concern or toward a shared concern. So um, I think, I mean, what envelops affectively is atmosphere. So, so question questions of how how you um, of how yeah qu questions of how you design a certain atmosphere to again prime for a certain an, an openness to certain complexity and certain kinds of activities or thoughts is really important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is... doesn't have to be foregrounded as content. It could be very liminal. Yeah. Yeah, but this is like a very good question and also very complex. <laughs> yeah, very complex, because it, it can, yeah, it's very hard to, to pull that off in ways that aren't really obvious or schmaltzy or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is a point where we are right now yeah. <laughs> with this question. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds really, really interesting. Okay. But I actually think that the, this this idea or term atmosphere is a very is a very productive one um, for ways that because also atmosphere cannot be like localized onto a single place. It is always you know a, a, a space that that you know that doesn't actually respect boundaries. Right. Yeah. It's vague. It's vaguely boundaried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's very very singular, but but not uh, not bound to any particular element in the space but somehow lifts off or emanates from them all. Yeah. 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 Um, Ines, you, you, were, you were going to say something? No, I'm just uh, happy where it's going. <laughs> I, I think it would be lovely if Brian could come back also as an advisor to the project <laughs> later. Maybe you don't want to follow all the little steps, but I think when it comes to, let's say, some more conclusive results, it would be great to have you. Well, I'd, I'd love to. And I mean, it's, it's a great, you know, it's a really challenging, interesting, good project and, and a great set of people. Um, mm -hmm. So if uh, I, I always feel a bit sheepish that I'm not sure I really can, can, can deliver something of, of, of use for it, but I'd be happy to come back and try. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's see. We're we're in we're in kind of a very intense process uh, right now, where the the kind of concept needs to be presented um, internally mid December and then publicly mid January. But it, so I think um, after that uh, we will. I mean, we 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 actually have some plans um, already for things that are happening. Um, as as was mentioned, we are building kind of a pop up synagogue. Um, and by pop-up, I don't mean this, this like urban phenomena where things appear and disappear. Um, mm -hmm. It's more a pop-up, like a pop-up book. 
um, right? Something oh, that wow. closes. Um, <laughs> and so that this will be, uh, this will be, I think, opened by the International Holocaust Remembrance Day uh, in January 27th, which is under two months. Wow. Um, uh, but yeah, so we, we, we really are uh, starting to move towards much more tangible things. Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah, so I think you know it was it was really wonderful to 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 have you back in and and Paula also to to have you here of course, um, and yeah I think you know as as this process moves on, um, it's a very uh, it's it's a very kind of DIY ad hoc process. We're kind of figuring it out as we go, but you know as we start moving towards uh, more kind of concrete uh, realities, uh, I think it would be it'd be really lovely to. Um, yeah, to, to, to be able to continue these conversations. I think they're yeah. really valuable, right? Because the most essential thing about what we're doing is we're, we're keeping questions alive. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd love to talk again. Great. Brian, so much. Okay. Thank, yeah, you. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay. Thank <laughs> Thanks also, Paula. I didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah. It's a great person. And I would love to go through your... Uh, encyclopedia is this really done just in the in the time of a week oh like from wow this is yeah. really impressive because it was also the system you had to make no this uh, this was fantastic <laughs> so yeah <laughs> i want to to see it if you can share it I'll, I'll i'll happily send it around to to all the group right after this great um, thank you it's great um, yeah so thank you everyone oh, and, uh, and I guess Ines and Anna, uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Um, and Paula and Brian, I hope to, hope to speak with you both soon. Yes, okay. great. Yeah, yeah, mention something tomorrow. That was not for everybody, right? Yeah, that, that was I just got worried. <laughs> but uh, Ines, let, let's, let's chat um, after this. And okay, I, perfect. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right, bye. Okay, bye, Brian. Bye, bye Paula. And everybody. Bye. Bye.